welcome to the Catacomic Machine. In this episode, you'll hear a conversation Preston Price had a few weeks back with Jeff Hood, who's a Baptist pastor, theologian, and activist in the Texas area. I've linked to his website in the notes so you can read a bit more about him there. Uh, But he's an interesting guy, and I really enjoyed listening to this conversation. There's something about the combination of the Texan accent and the Southern accent, the commitment to social justice, and a real dirty mouth that I really like. Anyway, check it out. By the way, the music you're hearing now was composed by a friend of the show's, Adrian Romero. So, thanks, Adrian. All right, here's Jeff Hood. My name is Reverend Dr. Jeff Hood. I uh, am a Baptist pastor. Uh, I function, I guess, as kind of a prophetic voice uh, in the midst of activism and the issues of our time. Um, I have a uh, extensive background in theological education. Uh, I did my doctorate with a focus on queer theology, uh, liberation theology. Um, at Bright Divinity School in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Besides that, I got four other master's degrees and two undergraduate degrees. So I've got uh, way too much education. But uh, nevertheless, I, uh, I'm an organizer. Um, I work with guys on death row uh, here in Texas. So I've spent a lot of time there. And uh, I've written 18 books. Uh mm-hmm. You know, everything from um, books about execution to uh, theological ideas about what it looks like to uh, encounter pain in a way that is sanctifying and uh, prophetic to those who are around you. Um, I've had a lot of interest in the uh, tragedy at Jonestown, uh, Mm -hmm. where the uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, committed suicide under the direction of uh, Jim Jones. Um, And what I've written about there is I've always been curious about this idea of um, even if the situation is shitty, uh, does the um, the hope of the person, the the will of the person, the intention of the person, make a situation holy that uh, perhaps looks you know unholy from the outside. And I think that's what my uh, that's what my work is about: engaging situations that look unholy and trying to find the uh, the hope and redemption and salvation in those spaces. Um, engaging issues of police brutality and seeking uh, not just justice, but um, you know a, a restoration to right. Um, I think it's important that we don't just talk about um, justice, but we talk about uh, setting the world to right. What does it look like for the world to be uh, rewound or set in the future uh, and set to right? Um, anyways, with that said, I have five children. We have twins that are six, uh, a four-year-old, and twins that are three. <laughs> we have uh, too many kids. We also have 18 chickens, three ducks, and five rabbits. Nice. Uh, and um, my wife's name is Emily, and she is an artist. And she um, is really engaged in talking about and thinking about what does it look like um, to create liberation or liberative moments uh, in art classrooms. Uh, so anyway, she's working on that. And um, we also have a dog. I should have said that. Uh, I don't need to leave her out. But uh, I grew up in Atlanta. 
So I'm definitely a product of the dirty South, uh, you know, Atlanta being a chocolate town. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I'm very influenced by uh, hip hop and uh, urban culture. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I, uh, I find myself, uh, looking at a picture off to the side. I guess I should get it. Um, can you see it? No, I got my reflections in the reflection. There we go. Yeah. It looks like a bright light with some person. Who's that person? Yeah. Bright light. And in front of bright light, you can see, uh, like state troopers uh, yeah. lined up. And then I'm standing on the other side. This is the first protest I ever attended. Okay. And, uh, you know, as a young man, and it was yeah. when, it, it was when Troy Davis was executed mm-hmm. in Georgia. And, uh, you know, I remember um, everybody was wearing the uh, I Am Troy Davis T-shirts. And... Uh, and I had on my I Am Troy Davis uh, T-shirt, and he was executed. And I remember thinking, when I uh, returned to the car, I am not Troy Davis, but how can I be Troy Davis? Hmm. And uh, I think that those types of questions, those kind of existential questions, are what have guided my work, continue to guide my work, and uh, you know, will guide my my work into the future. I mean, I've face death threats, I face physical violence, and I am of the opinion that uh, when Jesus calls us uh, into this kind of work, um, Jesus is asking us to come and and give our lives. And um, so I I guess the best way of saying it now is I, you know, after the Dallas shooting, I mean, I was so close to those uh, shots that were fired. You quickly uh, get to a place where you're not afraid of death. Hmm. You're not afraid of uh, physical pain, um, and I think that's that's the uh, highest level of liberation I've ever experienced. To know that you can follow Jesus, fight for justice, and no matter what happens, uh, you win. And uh, because God wins, love wins. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I guess those are a lot of my, I guess, introductory thoughts. No, those are good. I like them. Uh, there's a lot there to unpack. And I wanted to, first I wanted to ask you um, about how does a white man or a white boy from Atlanta growing up in a chocolate city um, become an activist, prophetic voice for Christianity? Um, knowing a little bit about you, you grew up in the SBC. So how do you go from an SBC, which is highly dogmatic, Calvinistic, very reformed, conservative in a lot of ways, to being a more prophetic, liberatory, queer theologian in that sense? Well, you know, I think I mean I think it's a very easy answer. I mean, you follow. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, ultimately, for me, I didn't get saved until I realized that. Um, the message of the gospel is to give your life for others, to love your neighbor as you love yourself, uh, to be willing to place your body into the conversation. Mm. And, uh, you know, all the time we live in a world that really shames the body. But uh, I think Jesus shows us over and over again that the body is uh, the pathway for salvation. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, so it's it's the work of the Spirit. And I don't, uh, I don't take you know credit for it. I, um, I think about uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and um, and the Ethiopian eunuch asks, you know, what must I do to be baptized? Where can you know he wants to be baptized right then and there? And uh, I feel like every time uh, I have an encounter with uh, the the ever living God. The, the the justice, the love, the uh, visceral presence of God. Uh, I am like that eunuch. I what, what you know? I want to engage. I want to you know move. And I never felt like that before. And so you know, I guess you can say I I came down the metaphorical aisle of liberty and justice and find myself baptized in the waters of hope. <laughs> 
that's awesome man um yeah you said earlier about uh you know you were close to death close to those bullets in dallas and i'm wondering um you said you, you don't fear death well, what is death for you uh, what is what is that, that i mean we're talking about bodies bodily death spiritual death i mean when you meditate upon death what are some of the thoughts that come up to you come come to you um liberation perhaps i mean i I mean, people, there are people that would get mad at me for saying that, but I do think there's something uh, liberative about death. And people ask, well, you know, are we racing towards death? Um, you know, perhaps that's what we're called to. I mean, maybe um, death, I mean, I think death is a meeting. Um, you know, I believe that to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Almighty God. Mm-hmm. So I believe uh, with all of my heart that um, we are called in this life to live uh, for that day and that moment when we meet God. So I, I look at death as nothing but uh, passing through um, a passage to another place. Interesting. I, t- I tend to I, t- I tend to agree to to agree with that. I just um, you know you in in the circles that we're kind of running in with this podcast, it seems like it's more of a radical theological circles, right? So radical Christianity, mm-hmm. and this kind of this kind of continuation. You know, continuation. You know, it's, funny. Yeah, go ahead. it's funny when we talk about uh, radical theology, radical Christians. <laughs> yeah, it, you know <laughs> what's radical right now ain't gonna be radical tomorrow. Uh huh. Uh, and I hear some of these cats talk, and they use all these, you know, dollar fifty, two dollar words. And I think to myself, that ain't a damn thing radical about you. What you're saying, you're just using big words to describe, you know, the old, the old shit. Uh, yeah. And you know, the scriptures, of course, tell us that there's nothing new under the sun. So right. we always have to. Uh, remember that too but nevertheless sorry no no that's interesting i think that's good pushback because um i, I bring more of a liberative theolo- theological bent into it and i'm more it, it, within the the lingua franca the, more of a confessional christian in the sense of you know i have a i have a devotion to a, a, an exist an existing god and a lot of the groups i run in like maybe the god question is bracketed off and and put to the side and how can we live in a post-christian post-christian world there are some of the main questions there how do we br- how do we build new communities um, for me, that stuff's interesting to me. And yeah, there are the dollar fifty-two dollar words. You know, you have these, <laughs> yeah, you, you have these big theories and these big theorists that are being used to kind of back to kind of um, to theorize about what it means to be living in this world. But I think for, for a lot of people, they really have experienced the death of God in their lives. In their lives, right? Like they have. Ex- I'm looking behind me. I've got framed up on the wall. Uh, the Time Magazine cover is God dead. Right. And. Uh, so this whole idea of the death of God um, and you know existentialism as it relates to uh, to God, I mean, I think these are uh, beautiful concepts that can that can certainly help us grow. But you know, I do get pissed off and it annoys the shit out of me when I hear people talking about radical theology and naming all these philosophers and theorists and we're having black people gunned down in our streets mm-hmm. I and mean, we're having babies ripped from the arms of their mothers and fathers so i mean i to be on on some level i don't you know really give a shit about what you think about derrida i care about uh what you think about um you know <laughs> here and now shit yeah um, you know and i I have a deep, deep love uh, for Altizer and, um, you know, a number of those guys. I think it is uh, Van Buren. I mean, their work is beautiful, but that's 50 years ago. I mm-hmm. mean, I mean, their work uh, laid the path for liberation theology. It laid the path for womanist, feminist, queer theology. And what we're living in now is how do we take these um, or revelations and put them into practice. And, you know, I think a lot of these radical, radical theolo- theology, radical theologians, um, they're stuck in 1966, 1967. And it's like, and even then, you got to ask yourself, in 66 and 67, as they're intellectually masturbating uh, over all of their existential thought, again, we got black folks dying in the streets. Right. We got, uh, the war in Vietnam raging, uh, women being treated like shit, 
and here you are spending all of your time in the ivory tower um and and i just uh on a lot of on a, on a lot of levels i find it disgusting and i i think to encapsulate it they say okay well jeff well, you've talked a lot of shit what's the end well you know what what's the for you know, what's the answer and i think for me, that all theology has to be practical. Right. If it's not practical, it is not theology. And, you know, and, and, and that's fine. You know, people have all kinds of hobbies. I mean, you know, some people collect tarantulas, and some <laughs> people like to pull all the leg hairs out. I mean, I don't know, but I do know that if you want to talk about God, it has to be practical. It has to meet us in the lived experience of where we are and where we are going. And certainly those existential questions are a part of where we are. But sitting there and using all these dollar fifty two dollar words to, you know, show how smart you are and how, you know, what theorists and whatnot you've read, um, I, I just, uh, again, I find it disgusting. Um, I'll say this and we can move on, but... I think about Oscar Romero, and uh, I've read a lot about Oscar Romero, been down to El Salvador, seen the tomb and uh, the crypt, I guess is the best way of saying it. And, you know, it's fascinating to me how early on in his uh, thinking, you know, he's much more conservative than where he ended, uh, much more orthodox is probably a better term. He was very interested in, you know, a lot of uh, the theorists and, uh, studying the scriptures and the Greek and the Hebrew, and um, it becomes very apparent in his life. He doesn't meet the, uh, you know, the living God until he ventures out in the streets with the living people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we see that in the gospel. I mean, Jesus's moments of, of greatest uh, revelation don't take place in the academy. They take place on the streets with random people who are poor and oppressed and marginalized and uh, in need of help. And you see that in him. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, the woman at the well, I mean, you know, he's encountering uh, all of these folks he's preaching to. I mean, he's in, uh, encountering the, uh, even there towards the end, uh, these brothers that are up on the cross with him. I mean, it's... Uh, It's beautiful, and if we're not experiencing God in that way, to me, you might as well just be talking about, you know, bullshit, what it smells like, what it looks like type thing. (laughs) No, I think that's funny. I think it'll be good to have some uh, some of your pushback on on that because I think a lot of I think a lot of the people that I'm talking with on these in these internet communities, and most of them I know are over the web, right? I don't know them in person because they're all over the world, but. they're looking at new ways to live, make make a radical theological or, or whatever you want to call it, death of God theology, this post post Christian theology in a in a practical form as well. You know, you have but they do yeah, go ahead. Let's go ahead and say this. Yeah. You can say post Christian, post religious, all of these types of things, but that is you know, no matter what terms you use, I mean it's not an excuse to not be in the streets engaging with people, loving people, and placing your body Mm -hmm. into the conversation. No, I agree with you. I mean, I just, uh, I'm just so troubled um, about uh, all of these folks who, I mean, again, don't get me wrong. I love um, this death of God movement. I think it's very important. I think uh, liberals in America, liberal theologians, uh, you will never see me call myself a uh, liberal theologian, maybe progressive theologian, queer theologian, radical, even radical theologian. But liberal theologians in this country have uh, deconstructed so much that there's nothing left. I mean, it's there's nothing uh, of value left. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my encouragement um, to me is you got to do two things. If you're going to talk about the death of God, you also have to talk about 
the resurrection of God. <laughs> because you can't talk about, I mean, in this theological context, you can't talk about death without talking about resurrection. And so um, the third piece that you got to throw in there is the restoration. The resurrection of God and the restoration of God. I mean, what, what does, uh, even if you don't want to use the word God, what, what can give people hope? What can um, provide restoration, salvation, resurrection um, to the, the people who are worst off uh, in our societies and in our world? Uh, and to me, that is the question of um, you know, death of God type thinking. How are we going to um, resurrect God or resurrect love or resurrect uh, you know, this uh, theologies of sacrifice and liberation. I did want to switch gears a little bit and ask you more about, aside from Jesus, of course, Jesus of Nazareth, um, who would be your spiritual forebears? Who are, who are the people you think about when you're in your, your deepest, um, darkest places and you, but you, that kind of push you beyond those places to get back in the streets and talk with people? You know, certainly, uh, certainly Dr. King. Mm-hmm. But also, uh, my sister, RuPaul. <laughs> How in the hell are you going to love somebody if you can't love yourself? Right. That's a, that's a theological, um, magical way of talking about things. You know, I, um, I have a lot of love and interest in Malcolm X. Uh, mm-hmm. I count him as a uh, tremendous... Uh, I guess, uh, influencer in my life. Uh, Oscar Romero, uh, of course, Dorothy Day. Um, you know, I look back to the 60s and, uh, you know, I'm sure I said Dr. King already, but uh, your Hosea Williams, uh, Andy Young, um, Fred Shuttlesworth in Birmingham. Um, and there's just so many um, I do uh, look to uh, the spaces of poverty and and those who are struggling. And uh, I think Johnny Cash represents uh, a lot of that. I think that that Biggie and Tupac, they represent uh, a lot of that. I mean, I loved Outkast growing up. And (laughs) I think that they were part of my my spiritual development. Yeah. You know, we... You know, I, I I find, you know, of course, I'm more of a um, probably a 20th century, uh, you know, I guess I'm a 20th century thinker. I mean, my master's degree is in 20th century U.S. history. Okay. Uh, Patrice Lumumba, uh, right. in Africa, Nelson Mandela, um, you know, I mean, I could go, um, right. I, I could go all over the world, but... Um, you know, I think it's also interesting. Uh, I like comics, and uh, I love the X Men, and so I find a lot of like you know because X Men really uh, represents, um, I guess, what it looks like uh, to to fight in the midst of injustice, and mm-hmm. even when people are persecuting you to still fight for those who are persecuting you. Um, there is liberation in fighting even for the oppressor. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that's a, I don't know, a magical way of um, talking, thinking um, about things. Um, you know, I feel um, certainly connected to Harvey Milk. I appreciate uh, so much his work. Um, Sartre, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess, I, you know, I could go on and on, but, uh, right. <laughs> no, it's I, just, it's just interesting. Cause I think that, um, I think we all have those people in our lives, whatever it is we're doing. I, I'm just, I'm just interested in like, you, you, Muhammad you, Ali, I love Muhammad Ali. Right. You know, you're, you're picking on people who fought battles, right? You're picking on people who, who were in the midst of things and they were fighting for justice. They're fighting for, you know, you said Sartre, right? So he's, he's part of the resistance in France under, under the Vichy Nazi regime, right? Right. So, yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty, 
Patrice Lumumba, who's assassinated by the help of the CIA in the in the in the Congo, I believe, um, fighting for their freedom from colonization and slavery, and the and the stealing and raping of their resources, and just the total destruction of, of their of their humanity. So. I know I like I like the prophetic gifts. I mean, those are people that inspire me too, and they inspire me even in their death to do something better with my life, to be out there. Like today, we had the uh, families belong together rallies all across the United States. Right? I was at my. I, it was the largest rally I'd seen in, in Medford and that I've ever been to, and that was. It made me cry because it was the most beautiful thing I'd seen in Medford in a long time. It was. It wasn't as big as the Women's March from from 2017, but it was still the biggest one in Medford. Um, the Women's March took place in Ashland, which is just down the south a little bit. But uh, these things, these things invigorate people. They they bring people together. You connect with people. You talk with them. You create new alliances. You get out there. And right now, there's a group in Oregon trying to get rid of Oregon sanctuary state status. And so there's a there's a there's another there's a, the counter group, which is the group I'm a part of. You know, making sure that we are a force to reckon with and, and trying to stop what they're doing. Right. So yeah, it's, it's crazy times right now, but it's, it's, but when I think I was talking with, um, Robin Henderson and Spinoza, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but, um, they're a queer theologian. Uh, they live in Nashville right now. And they were talking about what we were just talking about the hope. I was talking about the hope that people of color bring me when I see the shit that they've gone through for so long and they still have hope to push forward for like you're saying not just justice but a, a right world a, a world that's gone that's made right so i'm interested um sorry that was a little bit of a, a rant but or, but i'm just interested in what you what, what you think about like this idea of justice versus right what is what is a right world to you that's beyond justice hmm. yeah i mean i think the i guess twin hands of of love and justice and practice Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're told, and uh, Paul tells us in First Corinthians thirteen. I mean, just how powerful love is. Um, and we're told uh, also that greater love uh, hath no one than this, than those who are willing to give their lives, their bodies, um, to others. And you know, so. I think that a world set to right is uh, living out the gospel, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Um, and ultimately, that is, uh, that's salvific. And that type of world and that type of thinking uh, is salvific. Now, my, uh, I guess, critique in this moment or criticism in this moment is that uh, a lot of the liberals mm-hmm. that uh, I encounter um, they hate people as they hate themselves. Uh, you know, they've been oppressed, uh, you know, for being whatever identity uh, in this country, and they have taken that oppression, and they are seeking to oppress the oppressor. Well, ultimately, our salvation is wrapped up in the oppressor. Right. I mean, the oppressor must be saved in order for us to be saved. Um, and I think that's the nature of the gospel is to consistently place yourself in these uncomfortable situations and fight for um, love in the midst of fighting for justice at the same time. What does it look like for the oppressor to be saved? She had to stop stop oppressing. <laughs> okay. Sim- simple. I guess it was a simpler question than I, than I thought, you know. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, that was easy, but... Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just, I, I guess, you know, I spend too much time in my ivory tower. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there are a lot of easy answers out there. I mean, yeah. you know, I've read a number of philosophers. I mean, even philosophers that, uh, you know, everybody reveres and cites all the time. And I've thought, to, I get to the end and I think to myself, damn, they could have said all this shit in about two sentences. And I just read 120 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to publish something, right, to make it in the academic world. Yeah, that's right. I... And that's part of the problem, I think, is that we have a lot of people who do honestly want to do good academic work and scholarship. And I and I, I love scholarship. I love writing, or re, I love writing, but I also love reading good writers. And I think that there's also this kind of academic industrial complex where it's this whole notion of publish or perish. But again, that's getting away from the streets, I know, and, I, and I probably. Okay. I'm going to tell you, it's nothing but um, intellectual masturbation. 
And, you know, when, uh, whether you're pleasuring yourself or you two people are pleasuring each other, I mean, you do get to a point where, uh, you know, you climax and that's what you've been waiting on and <laughs> hallelujah and all those moments. But after yeah. that, it's kind of like, well, thanks. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, most, I think for a lot of people, there's not a lot after that. Right. I feel like with a lot of, uh, I feel like with a lot of scholars, that's what we're talking about. Uh, they put out this book, you know, that, you know, is coming out from Palgrave Macmillan or um, University of Oxford Press or Oxford University Press. Um, you know, it's fucking... 40 or 50 bucks to buy the book and you're so happy. And it's like, nobody's ever going to read that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Yeah. I have only, um, I've only spent that kind of money on one academic book in my life. And it was, uh, Jerry Dorian's book, uh, you know, the historian and you, yeah, yeah. Uh, his book, uh, it's called Social Ethics in the Making, and it okay. traces, and it's a history of social ethics in the 20th century in the building uh, of this discipline. Oh, man, it's, man, he's he's talented. That shit is great. But uh, most of the time, I mean, you know, ain't, everybody ain't teaching a union seminary, and everybody ain't a professor at Harvard, right. and uh, that shit ain't going to be worth 50 bucks. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I agree there. I mean, it, it's a racket. It's an industry, right? People just trying to make money. Usually, usually probably not the, uh, the writers either. <laughs> well, can you, I mean, you know, and it's, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, you look at somebody like Cornell West, who I think has, uh, affected our society. And, uh, I mean, he is the public intellectual of public intellectuals. Right. And, <clears throat> You know, when he was at Harvard and Princeton, I mean, he was constantly told that uh, he wasn't publishing the right stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, how many of you fucking assholes have been in the Matrix? I mean, you know, <laughs> it, like, right, I mean, right. talk about getting your message out there. Shit, right. you know, 75% of the country saw that shit. And, yeah. uh, you know, so... But I think that that steers us back to this practical place. Right. A theologian is not a theologian unless they are willing to meet God where God is. I mean, the scriptures say, I was hungry, I was poor, I, you know, I was in, on and on. I was in prison, you know, I was being um, brutalized, uh, you know, I was being... Uh, you know, Treated like shit, uh, you know, everybody was racist. I mean, I could go on and on. But what you've done to the least of these, you have done to me. I mean, God is in the street. God is with the least of these. And if you are a professor at Harvard, you no longer are in this space of the least on some levels. I mean, especially if you're an old white man. And uh, No, I agree. It's just insane to me. Um, and you're totally aloof from everything that's really going on. I mean, and that's why I think that's why a lot of people have a, a bad taste towards liberals and elite conservatives, right? The, the elites, because they're not really seeing the problems that are, people are actually facing every day. But so HP, I, I wanted to ask you, when you're actually in the streets with people and you're talking with people. Yeah, and you're, right there. I want to add to what you just said. Yeah. It makes me think about Paul Tillich. I very much consider myself to be a Tillichian uh, theologian. I love his writing. <clears throat> but Paul Tillich wasn't in the streets of Birmingham. I mean, he, he didn't go down to Selma. I mean, you know. He didn't say in Germany either. He wasn't Bonhoeffer. I mean, on and on and on. I mean, he was, uh, you know, doing a lot of things, and that we don't need to talk about that. But he, uh, and it oftentimes makes me wonder, makes me discount scholarship and discount theology if it's coming from a place of, of safety uh, as opposed to a place of danger. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think the gospel is always dangerous. Um, the life of Jesus was dangerous. So right. I want to toss that in there. 
No, that's good. Um, I was just going to ask you when you're actually in the streets, what is your ministry to people? What do you do? At, how do you minister to people in the streets or are, or are they the ones who are ministering to you? Well, I think that uh, presence is always the first ministry. And uh, most of the time it's the presence of, of the others that are ministering to me. Um, but, you know, when people start rubbing up against each other, I mean, it's this nature of the Imago Dei. Uh, in the image of God, the scriptures tell us that God is love, so we are made in the image of love. And so when we start rubbing our images up against each other, <laughs> there's a whole lot of love that happens. Right. And so um, love is God. Love is um, self-revelatory. And so... In those spaces, you just see this great, um, I guess, experience of love, perhaps similar to what you experienced today. I think so, yeah. And, you know, so everybody is ministering to each other. And a lot of times there's there's not a need for words because there is a, uh, <clears throat> there's a restoration. I mean, there is uh, the realm of God, the, the kingdom of God, uh, queendom of God taking place in that moment and so that's what we work for we work for those moments and uh, organizers or when I have, you know, put rallies together I mean that's what I'm seeking to create a moment of restoration for everybody who comes yeah I guess I could ask you a little bit about your work uh, so there are two things like I wanted to ask you a little bit about your mentor that you you've revealed in some of your writings that is the one who really shook you right or if you're more comfortable talking about that you de- work on death row I mean either one of those would be cool with me yeah, so um, so I had a minister that was uh, that I was connected to growing up and in college, and um, you know he had a tremendous influence on me. He was Southern Baptist, but he was, <laughs> I guess, a loving Southern Baptist or a kind Southern Baptist. Uh, it's not an oxymoron, um, <laughs> but. We stayed very close. And when I was in seminary, um, he basically called me and told me that uh, he was dying. And uh, I went to see him. And on his deathbed, um, he told me that uh, he was gay. Yeah. And, you know, his wife and kids were in the next room over. And it was a definitely a shocking moment for me. I mean, as far as I was concerned, I had never known anybody who was gay. I mean, of course, I had known people who were gay, but, uh, you know, being gay was about seeing, you know, pride on television and, you know, seeing all the folks rub up against each other and wondering, you know, what's that all about? But, uh, you know, when he told me that, it was uh, was an incredible gift um, because it was kind of a don't waste your life moment. Uh, You don't have to live... Um, secretly, you can live out loud. Um, you know, salvation uh, can be uh, this space of, uh, you know, I guess being who we are. And, you know, he really gave me a charge in those moments. I mean, it was about, um, you know, pushing and going to the marginalized and going to the oppressed. And um, it was truly a, a, a moment of uh, anointing. For me, and I'll uh, I'll never forget it. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking today uh, as we were, you know, I, I was out with the kids with the ducks, and uh, you know, I was watching how they were interacting with each other, and uh, you know, there was they're actually really incredibly smart creatures. Um, they have a lot of like interaction with each other and like interaction with the earth and the water. Um, but it just reminded me that, uh, and it, this will kind of be a good full circle, but it reminded me of uh, my mentor and he was always, uh, you know, a slow thinker or a ponderer, um, but he also wasn't, um, you know, afraid to speak, but he was very good at 
finding those moments, the right moments to, to speak and really, I guess, uh, speak prophetically. And uh, when I was thinking about the ducks, I was thinking, I was thinking, man, you know, everybody thinks ducks are, are dumb and don't do anything. Um, oftentimes they think they're not worth a shit uh, because they quack all the time. And what that made me think about is, uh, again, all of these academics and, and others who spend a lot of time quacking. Uh, you know, they spend a lot of time talking about how miserable and how awful, um, you know, it is that these children are being ripped out of their parents' arms on the border. But it seems to me like, uh, you know, if Jesus is with the marginalized and oppressed, Jesus is living on the border right now. Right. And so it's through these rallies and trips to the border that we find Jesus. And I think anything else beyond doing that is, uh, seems to me to be like a whole lot of quacking.